What's up guys, Commander Alex here, and today I'm gonna to be talking to you guys about scaling. So basically, this video is gonna cover which heroes scale well, which heroes have power spikes in different parts of the game, which team comps scale well, and just kind of cover the entire topic of scaling in Vainglory. It's a pretty big topic, I probably won't get to everything, so if I do miss something, please just you know feel free to leave a comment saying you, know, you missed this, or I think this is maybe something that you um, explained wrong or something, and I will probably comment back saying you're absolutely right. Um, and then in you know some rare cases, I might say, you know no, I didn't actually miss that, I just disagree with that, or something like that. Uh, but I do wanna get some interaction from your guys' part on this video, just because it's such a big topic, and I don't feel like I'm gonna be able to cover absolutely everything in the video, but I'm gonna do my best. So uh, I guess we'll just hop into things here. So I do have the game pulled up on my iPad right here, and oops, I just clicked on uh, just clicked on some link. But yeah, so basically we're gonna go through to start off with which heroes scale well. So I'm gonna pull up the shop and that has all the different heroes in it. And basically I'm gonna go down the list. Now keep in mind, I'm gonna skip heroes that are getting major changes in the next update. Um, that is 1.9 just because if any information I give on them is gonna be probably outdated by the time 1.9 comes out, which is um, gonna be very, very soon. So I'm just gonna skip those heroes and you know, after the update comes out, hopefully you guys for yourself can figure out how strong or how unstrong they are. It's just um, gonna be a matter of preference and a matter of how they're changed. Uh, but first off here, we have Adagio. Now Adagio is a support, so scaling on supports isn't actually as impactful to a game as scaling on uh, rather like carry champions, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's something to keep in mind. So Adagio has a very strong early game. And the reason for this is that he has a very, very strong CC in his slow. He can also heal his allies, which is good in the early game since um, there's a lot of slow fights, which allows him to get a lot of heals off. And he can also boost his allies damage, um, which is good in the early game because no one really has a ton of damage in the early game. So basically he's good in the early game and he, has some potential in the late game, but the reason he falls off in the late game is because his ultimate, which is his main form of CC, where he um, sets people on fire and then uses his ultimate to stun everybody, is very easily reflex blocked with a crucible, and obviously that means that uh, he loses a lot of his potency in the late game, assuming you're playing against a team that knows what they're doing. So that's kind of why he's good in the early game and not so good in the late game. Moving on here, we have Arden. Arden is very good in the early game just because of his stats. He has really, really nice base stats, and in the late game, he can do well because he has that really game-changing ultimate. Um, but again, a reflex, blocks can, a reflex block can allow everyone from the enemy team to get out, and uh, it really makes him a lot less potent in the late game. So if you don't get a lead in the early game with either Adagio or Arden, you're gonna probably be struggling in the late game with them, assuming your team comp is uh, scaling fairly similar to you. Moving on here, we have Catherine. Now Catherine is, in my opinion, one of the best scaling heroes in the game. She has a, a piss poor early game, I'll be honest guys. She doesn't have a lot that makes her strong in the early game. Um, I used to think that she had a good early game because she had a stun, but really, CC in the early game isn't as uh, useful as people think it is. So with Catherine, you have her passive, which allows her to, over time, as she stuns more and more people, gain shielding and armor. Now stats like that are really, really good because when you get to max build, she just keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger. At say 25 minutes, you should probably have pretty close to your max build. But once she hits her max build, she just keeps gaining armor and she just keeps gaining shield and she just becomes harder and harder to kill. And you know, if you have a game that goes beyond 30 minutes, she's gonna get to the point where it's just impossible to kill her. And that's really the nice thing about Catherine. There's no cap to how strong she can get. That being said, if she gets shut down early game, she has her stun, but that can be reflex blocked. And other than that, she doesn't have a lot going for her. She's just very, very tanky and very annoying if she gets ahead because you can't really kill her. Um, that being said, again, if you reflex her stun, she doesn't have any really really good CC except for her ultimate, which can be silenced, uh, which is a silence and can be reflex blocked. And uh, and really just like the other champions that I've been discussing, if you have a reflex block or a crucible, she's gonna become a lot less potent. So um, that's one thing to keep in mind when playing as Catherine. But you know, if you get to that deep, deep late game, she's just gonna become a real pain in the neck to deal with. All right, so moving on here, we have Celeste. Now Celeste is kind of an interesting hero in the fact that she doesn't scale incredibly well, but she doesn't have an incredibly good early game either. Uh, basically, Celeste has some strengths that make her good in certain team comps. So she's really good at poking the enemy team, which if you have a team comp that's based around that, can make her incredibly strong in the late game because you don't poke people in the early game that much. You can you know harass them in the laning phase, but you never go for a siege in the early game. It's just not something that you do. But in the light game, you're almost always trying to either force a fight in the jungle or siege a turret, forcing them to fight you um, and, and 
you know, just trying to force something out of the enemy team. Because if you just allow them to farm, then the game's going to go on forever. Um, so the one thing that Celeste is really strong in the early game about is poking. But at the same time, if you have a team comp that's based around going all, the, all in on people, she's not going to work very well because she doesn't have that ability. She doesn't have the health and she doesn't have the... Um, skill set to be able to go in all in an enemy team so in the early game she's fairly good at harassing she has okay wave clear uh, and in the late game she's really good at poking but only if she has the right team count that's why i'd say that celeste is a stronger late game champion but is really quite a weak champion unless you pick a comp that really complements her well you want to pick a comp that's based on poke you don't want to pick a hard engage comp with her all right moving on here we have fortress fortress is one of the final supports that i'll be talking about and fortress has uh, an interesting skill set. If you play him at a very low level, you'll notice he has really, really good damage in the early game. And that makes him a very strong early game threat. But at high levels, he's also very strong in the late game. And the reason for that is that Fortress has good DPS. That is damage per second or um, damage per shot, I guess you could say. Basically, it means that he does percent health damage with his bleed, meaning that if you get six stacks on someone, you can burn through a tank very easily, making him very great in a support v support battle, which tends to happen in the end game because you'll have a 3v3 fight where all the carries will die and then it's only the uh, supports left in the end. So um, it's something to keep in mind. Obviously, he's kind of fallen onto the meta lately, so he's not strong in really any part of the game right now, um, but I'm guessing that's going to change at 1.9, and I'm hoping that they're going to bring back that you know early game easy fortress but then late game like if you have the skill on him you can really be potent with him so i classify him as no real scaling through any part of the game he doesn't have any super big power spikes but if played correctly he can do very well into the late game all right moving down the list here we have glaive now glaive is one of those champions that really blooms into the late game he has you know an okay early game there's a couple of characters that he counters very very well taka being one of them he has a lot of aoe meaning that it's hard for taka to go invis and not get hit by something um so that's kind of one hero that he can duel out early game and actually come ahead in but for the most part he's not going to do well in the early game just because his afterburn is on a very long cooldown and that's where he gets a lot of his potency from but into the late game he has great dps he can burn through turrets and he has a punt that can put an enemy out of position very very easily and that's why i classify him as probably one of the better late game scalers he blooms fairly late into the game but if he gets going he's really going to take over the game all right, next here we have Jewel. Now, Jewel is kind of an interesting character. I'm going to be talking about Weapon Power Jewel. Obviously, CP Jewel is the thing you can go for, but I feel like Weapon Power is a little more viable, so that's who I'm going to be uh, talking about today. And Weapon Power Jewel, it depends on where you play her. If you play her in lane, she's going to be a late scaler, just because early game, you're going to get poked out by the enemy laner, and there's really not much you can do about that. But you're also going to get a lot of CS, and into the late game, your Thunder Strikes are going to be hitting incredibly hard, making you a real late game threat. If you're playing if you're playing Jewel in the jungle, though, the fact that she has a jump, which is also a CC, and fairly good early game damage coupled with her uh, forward-facing armor and shielding, she actually is very strong in the early game in the jungle. If it's an even fight, she will win. The only issue is that in the lane, it's not usually an even fight because the other person has range on you and they'll be able to poke you down, meaning you can't really fight. So that's where I classify lane jewel as a late game carry and I classify jungle jewel as kind of a carry throughout the entire game. She's pretty good in the early game, pretty good in the late game, and uh, never really has any super big power spikes that make Jewel incredibly OP. Um, so that's kind of where I'd go with that. Next year we have Kashka, and Kashka is kind of the classic example of a very strong early game jungle carry. Kashka has really, really great base stats and her abilities. She has great move speed, and she has the fact that her auto attacks actually reduce the cooldown on her abilities, meaning that she can spam them even in the early game. So uh, that's where I classify Kashka as a really strong early game character, but she does fall off into the late game because she doesn't have great scaling on her abilities, and tank Kashka is just kind of falling out of the meta lately. So um, I'd say that she's you know really strong in the early game she gets that advantage she can't snowball off of it very well but if she doesn't get any real advantage in the early game she will fall off into the late game moving on here we have jungle cruel we have probably the king of the late game guys most people will classify cruel as the strongest late game character catherine's definitely up there but i'd say that if you're if you gotta pick one it's gotta be cruel he has this amazing skill set between a shiver steel breaking point and 
just full tank and mobility and he can chase down anybody he won't die and he will get a bunch of damage with his breaking point so the issue with cruel is that if he gets shut down into the early game he really can't do anything into the late game but if he gets to that late game if he gets to that late game strength he'll blow through an entire team and he won't even break a sweat about it. The thing about Cruel is that he really requires a Shiver Steel, a Breaking Point, and Boots. Once he gets those items, he really becomes dangerous, and then after that, he can just keep building tank or a bone saw if the enemy team starts building armor against him, and really just make it a crappy, crappy game for them. So with Cruel, very strong late game, very weak early game, and to counter him, you always want to invade him early game. That's the number one rule I can give you, probably even for like Vainglory. Invade Cruel early, or you're going to regret it. All right, moving on here, we have Petal. Now, Petal is going to be changed, so I'm not going to say much about her, but Petal has classically had a very strong early game and a medium to weak late game. So that's where I'm going to classify her. I'm not going to go too in-depth on her because her abilities are being changed. All sorts of stuff is being moved around with her, but that's what I'm going to say about her. She has a strong early game, weak late game, and I'm assuming it's going to be similar in 1.9. But again, don't trust me on that because I haven't actually played 1.9 yet. Um, I'm still working with uh, a dev to see if I can get in and uh, play that early so that I can get gameplay for you guys. Anyway, here we have Ringo. Ringo is kind of an interesting character because he doesn't have amazing scaling. He has a fairly strong early game, but he has a fairly weak mid game. So um, basically the thing with Ringo is he has some great ability combos where he can cancel auto attack animations, meaning that he can get a bunch of auto attacks off in quick succession. And basically what you do is you auto attack, you use your Quicksilver, which resets your auto attack animation, allowing you to auto attack again. Then you can throw in your Achilles shot, throw in another auto attack, and basically early game you can just just throw a ton of damage into someone with that. It's kind of insane actually how much damage you can do if you're playing Ringo right in the early game, but into the late game that doesn't really matter as much. But into the late game he scales really well because he has that attack speed boost from his Quicksilver. So basically the thing with Ringo is he has a very strong early game, a fairly good late game, but a not very good mid game. So what you want to do is kind of play passive into the early game and then once you get to the mid game where he can't just blow you up with all of his auto attacks, that's when you want to strike him. That's when you kind of just want to shut him down and you don't want to let him get into his late game because his late game is one of the stronger late games in the game. Uh, that being said, it's nothing like Coral. If you get a late game Ringo, he's not going to be able to take over the game, um, but he will have pretty good DPS. All right, moving on here, we have Rona. Rona is kind of like Kashka in the sense that Kashka really requires snowballing, and so does Rona. So Rona has great early game damage. Her foe splitter is just, it's insane how much damage you can do with that early game. Um, but if you don't really get that advantage on Rona, then you're not going to be able to get an item advantage, and that means you won't be able to assassinate people in the late game and that basically makes you useless. So what you have to do is run it, get a couple early kills, and continue that early game strength because if you don't, you're gonna fall off in the late game. So that's why I'd say that Rona has fairly bad scaling, um, but really good snowball potential if you get her going in the early game. Moving on here, we have Saw. So Saw's being changed, I've heard. I don't know exactly what's going on with him, but it sounds like he's gonna kind of be a little iffy. So he has a strong early game, obviously in a 1v1 scenario. In a 1v2 or 1v3, he's useless. In the late game, in a team fight, he's generally useless because he doesn't have any mobility. So, Saw is very situational. If you have, if you're playing against a jungle that won't rotate up, then you can bully the crap out of your laner and basically just shove him into turret, take his first turret, and if the enemy team doesn't come and gank you, you can just continue to shove down the lane. That being said, if the enemy team's jungle actually cares about you, your early game is going to be really crappy, your late game's not going to be that great, and really, you're not going to have much of a chance. Um, with Saw, it really depends on if the enemy team knows how to counter you, because if they don't, you're going to be good in the early game, you're going to be good in the late game, you're just going to be an absolute menace to them. But if they know what they're doing, they'll be able to shut you down really easily in any part of the game, and it won't be much of an issue for them. So that's why Saw doesn't have any real scaling either way, but he, uh, he can be very, very strong if you don't know how to counter him. Moving on here, we have Scarf. So Scarf's one of those heroes that has a strong early game if played correctly, but has an even stronger late game. So Scarf's early game is strong because he has really good all-in potential with his passive, but you have to be careful because there are stronger heroes in the game early game like Ringo. A well-played Ringo can outplay Scarf in the early game, um, but late game, Scarf's one of the strongest laners in the game. And the reason for that is that he has very strong poke, he has very strong kiting with his goop, and he's great team fighting with his ultimate. Now his ultimate is a little iffy, sometimes it's better to just continue to drop goops and spitfires on an enemy, um, but definitely if you're going for that wombo combo 
with the uh, Celeste alt, with the Jewel alt, with the uh, Scarf ultimate all together, then that can be a lot of AoE damage, which is really good in those late game team fights. So that's where I'd say that he has a really good late game, um, great poke, great peel, just everything that you could really want out of a late game carry. Um, and the only issue with him is that his early game if he gets beat, can, you know, just really shut him down late game. So I'd say he has good scaling, but he just really needs to get through his early game without any issues and uh, hopefully even come out a little bit ahead. Moving on here, we have Taka. Taka has a fairly weak early, early game, uh, but once he gets, you know, level three, four, five, six even, um, he really starts to bloom. So he has a weak early game, pretty strong mid game, and then into the late game, it really depends on if he's picked up some kills. Taka is one of those heroes that snowballs very well. If he picks up some kills in the mid game, he will become an absolute beast in the late game. But if he doesn't, then he will fall off in the late game. So Taka has good scaling into the mid game, and it really depends on if he snowballs, if he does well or bad into the late game. And finally here, we have Vox. So Vox is probably in 1.8 one of the best scaling uh, laners he has great aoe damage in team fights he has fairly good just single target damage with an alternating current and obviously he's very very item dependent since all of his abilities are cp related and cp carries tend to be more item reliant than weapon power carries that being said vox is getting quite changed in the next update so i'm not going to say much more about him because i really don't know where he's going to land in the next update all right, so next thing we're going to talk about is team comps. So basically, there's a couple of different styles of team comps that you can run in Vainglory, and each are going to have different strengths and different weaknesses. So the first comp that you can run is the ranged laner and double assassin jungle. This is a rather uncommon comp because you don't really have anyone that can run an iron guard, but at the same time, it has amazing kill potential. Basically, the idea with this is that you run like a Kashka Taka jungle or something like that with a Ringo lane, and you have incredible early game strength. You will be able to blow up the enemy team in the early game, and if you can, you know get through that early game with an incredible advantage you will be able to snowball the game off of it that being said if they play it correctly they kind of turtle up they don't let you take that first turret and they just you know get through the early game with reasonable cs and few deaths then they will win in the late game because having a support rather than an extra assassin on your team is more useful because you can keep your carries alive and that means that you get more damage out of them in the end game. So um, this comp is very strong in the early game but falls off into the mid and late game if you don't snowball off of it. Next we're going to talk about the more standard comp which is the regular laner, the support, and the jungle warrior. So this is kind of like a... Um, I'm not even sure who you could say. Maybe a Ringo, Arden, and uh, Rona. That would be a, that would be a jungle ro warrior um, support comp, which basically scales pretty linear linearly. So you're gonna want to have a support that either is good in the early game or late game, and either a uh, good in the early game or late game jungle, and that's gonna allow you to balance each other, making you not have a really strong early game, not have a really strong late game, just be pretty linear, and it's a very, very strong comp to counter in solo queue, because you don't know what you're facing in solo queue, so by throwing out a comp that doesn't have any major power spikes or major power dips, it makes you very, very hard to counter from the enemy team's perspective, because if they have a weak early game comp, then you're gonna beat them early game. If they have a weak late game comp, then you're gonna beat them late game. There's really um, no counter to this except for mirroring the strategy and then outplaying that person. So that's where I'd say that having a standard support warrior and laner comp is probably one of the most safest and least scaling comps in the game. And the fact that it doesn't have a good early game or a late game is just average throughout the entire game. Next comp we're gonna talk about is the assassin support laner comp so basically what you do is you have a regular laner in lane who's gonna doesn't really matter if he scales well or not you have a regular support and then you have an assassin now assassins are snowball champions meaning that they need to have a good early and mid game to do well in the late game this means that this comp basically revolves around their assassin getting ahead if you have a taka catherine and ringo comp then you really want your Taka to start getting going because if he doesn't, he's gonna become a non-factor and that means you're basically fighting 2v3 and that makes your comp very, very weak in the late game. So um, an assassin in the jungle usually means that you wanna have a strong early to mid game and uh, if you snowball, you can't have a good late game. For the most part, you're gonna fall off into the late game. So those are the comps that I kind of commonly see. I mean, obviously you have all sorts of different comps. You have uh, some comps that will actually run a melee in the lane. You have comps that are based off of all stuns, um, really niche comps like that that I'm not gonna talk about, but those are standard things that you should be looking at. And then obviously you have comps that uh, have really good synergies together, which are, is a whole, whole different subject that I'm really not gonna get into, but um, 
just to brush over it, wombo combos are what you're looking to get when you're looking to build a really, really fine-tuned comp. So wombo combos are when you can combine abilities together to do something in the game that normally you just wouldn't be able to do. Um, an example of this would be an Arden Glaive comp. So basically what you can do is drop an Arden Gauntlet and then afterburn somebody through that gauntlet, forcing them to be stunned and throwing them into your team. Now that's a combo because it basically combines the gauntlet and the afterburn from two different heroes to make an effect that's very, very hard for anyone to counter. So um, that's why I'd say that they're niche comps and you're not gonna see them all that often, um, but comps like that can scale very well or not well. Um, it really just depends on what that sort of combo is and how the heroes individually scale. So hopefully you guys got something out of this video. I know there's some stuff I didn't go over. I know that maybe I focused too much on other stuff. Uh, but you know, leave a like if you like the video. If you didn't like the video, leave a dislike. And if you like the content that I'm making, please subscribe so that you can see more. And I'm Commander Alex and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. See ya.